Um, all right, so, I, so I'm a mathematician, and I feel comfortable talking about biology to physicists and physics to biologists, but I'm really scared to say physics in, so in front of physicists and bio in front of biologists, and I'm going to do all of that today. All right, so, um, so some of what I tell you is not exactly right, but it's the way that I think about it, all right, and, uh, and we'll go with that, all right? Um, so the majority of the time, I think we're going to end up talking about uh, the action of these type 2 uh, topoisomerase, uh, topo 4, and then I hope to talk a little bit about uh, glue ball and glue ball decay uh, later in the talk. So, all right. So here's the problem. I don't know if any of you have children, but uh, Despicable Me, beautiful movie with these little minions here. And I want you to imagine you're the minion, all right, and you're given this, this little piece of rope, and um, what you're supposed to do is get the knot out of it, all right? So first of all, you're supposed to see that there's a knot, and then you're supposed to get it out. And the way that you do this is you can take kind of one spot that looks like this, and you can cut one of them and pass it through and do like one little crossing change. Does that make sense? So you get to do that somewhere here, and in doing so, you have to make this thing into just something that's equivalent to a circle. So um, you might look a little bit more like this, because you get the little scissors, all right? Um, the problem is that you're actually not that big. You're much smaller, all right? You're like that size, and also you can't see. All right? So you're this tiny thing, and you have to find somehow the right place to act on this. All right? And so that's kind of what these type 2 topoisomerases do. All right? And what we want to do is figure out how they could possibly find the right spot to act. All right? So I'm going to give you, this is, uh, all right, so now this is where I'm afraid to talk in front of you, Lynn. But anyway, so topoisomerases are these enzymes uh, they regulate tangling sort of stuff and supercoiling in DNA. Uh, there are type 1 topoisomerases which cut one strand and type 2 that cut two strands. Uh, Dushan was talking about this yesterday. Um, so it cuts both strands of the double-stranded DNA. It works a little bit like this. Well, I mean, this is something I stole off the web. Uh, but the idea is that it grabs one piece, the G segment, um, kind of traps that part, uh, you get another segment that goes down, it clips the blue piece, passes the red piece through, reattaches the blue piece, and it goes through. So it changes something that looks like this, cuts it, and changes it to look like that. All right? Um, all right. All right, so this is what I found out that I was just lying to you. But anyway... So the great thing about these type 2 topoisomerases is that, there's, that they're used as chemotherapy, drugs and also as antibiotics. And so this is great for grant writing because it, the congressmen don't want to go after your grants because it says that you're trying to save humanity a little bit. One of the wonderful things here. All right, so the idea is that these top isomerase, uh, if you give them this chemotherapy drugs, it signals to the cell that it wants to die. Is that fair? It's a suicide signal. So anyway, that's the way these things work. But they're important because they deal with this top or with this supercoiling, and we want to understand kind of how they work. All right. All right. Uh, so here's more pictures. I think this is one. I think you showed ones like this yesterday, Dushan. Um, all right. So we're dealing with something called TOPO4, which is a type 2 TOPO isomerase. Um, and it mostly does kind of unlinking here. It also relaxes some supercoiling, but we're kind of dealing with unknotting and unlinking. And uh, people have found that it's very good at unlinking stuff, much better than kind of random sort of action. So it's going to do something like this, right? That's, your, that's you sitting right there. All right. So you wonder how the thing figures out where to act, right? Andre always tells me that these enzymes don't think, right? They're mechanical things. They just do something, right? I still like to think of them as thinking, but they don't really. All right, so where do they know how to act? Well, one thing is that maybe they just attach when things are close together and they do one of these actions. It's basically like random sort of thing. Um, 
But that doesn't seem to be the case, all right? Um, and there are a couple of problems, at least, with this. One is that every time TOPO4 or these type 2 TOPO isomerases act, they use energy. So this is a huge waste if, uh, if they were just to continue to use energy and then basically have to undo what was just done. Um, the other problem is, uh, and anyone who's like untied cords knows that if you kind of pass the wrong piece of string, the wrong place, you create a gigantic mess, right? When you undo your shoelaces and you're not paying attention, all of a sudden you're like, how could this be so awful when it normally just pulls out, right? So the point is that you can easily, by doing the wrong sort of movement, increase the amount of entanglement instead of decrease it, all right? And that doesn't seem to be the case. So in particular, we're thinking of this as being our, our molecule here, our DNA. And in this situation, it doesn't seem to act in these twisty regions, all right, which wouldn't create a problem so much as just be a waste of energy. It seems to know to act um, in these regions where you're actually simplifying the entanglement. All right? All right. So then the question is, how do they find this right place to act? All right? And so now this is my very lean background. Um, so Cosarelli's lab had this stuff that said that TOPO4 basically is very efficient at unknotting DNA. Uh, Greg Buck and Lynn had this, um, this model that it was these hook juxtapos juxtapositions. So somehow maybe it acts where these two pieces are coming together like this, like what we see right here. Um, and then Husan did some stuff with Lynn as well with some simulations. You also have a has a um, poster out there which is a little bit of, along the same lines, um, trying to see if acting at these hook juxtapositions does simplify the knotting, basically found that that is the case. Uh, Andre Stasiak did some work in Chris Soderis as well. I think I have everyone that worked on it. Um, and, then, uh, and then from Giovanni's lab with Andre and his, uh, I guess, uh, Witz was a PhD student at the time, right? Um, they found that by super, that supercoiling can basically tighten the knot. And the idea is that if you've got supercoiling and you tighten the knot, then you might be more likely to create situations that look like this, which then maybe the topo four can find and then do the action there. So we wanted to see if kind of putting all that stuff together would create some sort of geometry that the, um, that the topo four could, could find, right? Could isolate, all right? And so that's what we're trying to do. All right, so the basic idea is we're going to create some simulated DNA chains, and we're going to take places that look like this, these hook ducts of positions, we're going to pass it through itself. We're going to do like a, we're going to do our little um, computer version of a topo four, and then see what happens, right? So this is us. Um, some other things to keep in mind, uh, which will tell us a little bit, well, which, uh, motivates why we looked at some of the quantities that we looked at. One thing is that it appears that TOPO4 uh, either likes DNA that's bent or likes to bend DNA. I think that's not exactly known which of the two it is. But anyway, it prefers to have the one segment uh, be bent and that it seems that it prefers certain sort of angles, all right, of one of them next to the other. All right, so this is what we actually did then. So we're going to simulate, we have worm-like uh, chains. We're doing this all on a computer, all right? And we generate some chains. And this red thing right here is our G segment. So it's the thing that the TOPO2 attaches to. And the blue curve is the one that's supposed to simulate as passing through the red one, all right? So we're going to have something like this. And we're going to basically move that blue one down to here, all right? We're going to pass it through. And some technical stuff, um, we actually don't use this, you know, we actually replace three segments by a straight line, so it's a little easier to keep track of angles and stuff like that, but I'm not sure that you really care about that. And we looked at juxtapositions that are within kind of like two edge lengths. That's how close they have to be together. So if they're like this, but they're far away from each other, then we don't do it. They have to be close and kind of next to each other, all right? And then the sort of things that we measured were, well, we measured other stuff, but the sort of things that actually mattered in the end were 
how much this one was bent, the G segment. All right, so that bending angle right there. And the other thing was uh, the angle with respect to each other. So if you could kind of look down on the red one to see that angle at which the blue one lies over. And this is going to be a, right, this is going to be a, a, like an oriented angle, right? So this is a, I forget if we called this positive or negative. I guess this is positive, and then the other way is, is negative. All right. So that's what we're doing. Okay, so we generated these worm-like chains. These were done by uh, Julian, who's in uh, Andre Stasiak's lab with Dushan. Um, we generated negative trefoil knots and then link chains. So this is like one of the trefoil knots. This is one of the links or catenanes. Um, and we were simulating, you know, three KB chains. So um, just 334 edges, and we used a delta LK of 16 and that's just measures how much supercoiling that we have in it, all right? Um, and so this is what they look like. All right, this is an example. All right, so now I just want to rehash where we are so far in case you didn't understand anything that I said so far. This is a re-entry re point to the talk if you care to listen any further, all right? So um, the point is that uh, DNA gets tangled during replication. There are these enzymes, these TOPO4, that do the unknotting and unlinking, and they have to figure out where to act, all right? They have to be smart about it to some extent. And we want to figure out if the supercoiling basically tells us some, or spots some, highlights some spots where you could act and preferably uh, simplify either the knot or the link. All right, did I say everything here? Uh, yes, all right. And I had to put the guy down here because I like to have at least one picture on every slide, right? Otherwise, I just feel wrong. So, anyway. Okay, so first we're going to start with the knots, all right? So we're starting with a knotted configuration, and we're trying to see what, what we can find out here. So um, some observations. There's just two examples of this. Um, so the knots tend to get localized because of the supercoiling. This is kind of what uh, Giovanni found earlier. Um, and usually what happens is the knots end up at one of the two ends, all right? So the knot tends to isolate down to the end. The same way Dushan had the simulation where they were open, remember? And he was twisting the thing and the knot just kind of flew off the end, right? And so it's the same sort of idea here. And the other point is that you get lots of places where the knot is kind of close to itself, right? So you get a lot of kind of potential places where they're close enough together that the topo isomerase could act, all right? And has to decide whether that's a good spot or not. Um, we, so we usually saw it look like this, but sometimes we would have the knot move, you know, in between the thing, which made us think that the Monte Carlo stuff was actually working. Yeah. Yeah, I th you know, Julian dealt with that part of it, but I think it's crankshafts and maybe some reptation sort of stuff. Yeah, I think he actually does, he figures out how big of a crankshaft you can do to guarantee that the knot stays the same, that you're not passing anything through itself, and um, it ends up for a long kind of, you have to run this thing a really long time to get a sample, you know, but, but when you do, you know, when you see samples where that knot is actually moving its way through, you're heartened with the fact that it's working, right? Somehow if it's always down at that end, then you're, it's not so great. All right, so this is, so this is what happened, all right? This is the data right here. Um, all right, so this is alpha one. Remember, alpha one is how much the, the, the first segment is bending, all right? The one that it, the topo is supposed to attach to, all right? Um, the, because of the way that the angle is measured, a low alpha means that it's really tight bending and a high alpha means that it's like straight, okay? Because it's an in interior angle, not an exterior angle. So this means that it's very highly bent and this means that it's not bent at all, all right? So this is a stacked histogram. The green part, uh, so okay, so this is, this tells us the distribution of angles that we saw at juxtapositions by, um, by this bending angle. And then the green part of it tells you how many of the juxtapositions, if you do the topo 2 action, or topo 4 action, how many of them keep the same knot type, 
And the blue ones are the number of ones where you actually simplify the not type, okay? So the total height of this thing is the total number of, uh, is the histogram for this thing, and then it's colored by how many of them actually change. So you can see that there are lots of um, bending angles up here in the 140 to 160 range, but a low percentage of them actually change the not type, right? Now on the other hand, if you look down here, you see that there aren't as many of these, but there's a higher percentage of them where doing that top 04 action would change the knot type. So up here is, a, is the um, uh, renormalized, basically, version of this. And so you can see that, uh, that when you have more bending, it is more likely that, you're, that your action is going to change the knot type. All right? So this is kind of consistent with what we see here. All right. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes. No. Well, it does kind of, right? If it's in the supercoiled part, I guess it would not be bending as much as it would in the, in the, like the trefoil region. Uh, but you know, these things are also just vibrating. So every once in a while you see some low bending in the knotted region, some high bending in the supercoiled region. And so I think that's part of it. Yeah, Luca. No, because we made sure that the edges never passed through each other at any of the steps. So the trefoil was always there. It started with it there and then it always stayed there. What's, that's part of the code, yeah. All right, um, all right. So this is so this is again the same one. I just made it bigger. That was fun, wasn't it? All right. So um, so again, alpha one's the bending angle, and what we're seeing is that higher bending angle does improve the chances that it's going to simplify the knot. All right. If you were to choose those the ones that have higher bending angle, you have a higher probability of changing the knot type. Um, now theta is this angle, right? Looking at one of the, the T segment over the G segment, I guess. All right, and here you can see the effect is much larger, right? Most of the, you know, you're more likely to see angles on the order of 40 to, you know, 70 degrees here, but almost none of those change the knot type because those are all kind of in that super coiled region, right? On the other hand, if you look down here in the negative region, negative theta values, then nearly all of them will change the knot type. So there aren't many of them, but if you act there, you're almost always going to be successful. All right? Why is it not symmetric? Because it's... Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right. And so the, it looks, this minus 45 degree angle looks like roughly like that. That's the whole point. So then, so the, I guess, okay, so then there's the combined effect, all right? Can you, now can you look at, al, at alpha one, so this bending angle and this, uh, you know, is it like a coupled quantity? And so here we get like a heat graph, and you can see that there's more of an effect. You know, when I look at this thing, I, I kind of see a diagonally sort of vision of this thing, which suggests that, um, that theta is more of a, well, that theta, you know, clearly this thing has a verticalness to it, but it's slightly kind of horizontal. So, so clearly, like, theta is the major player here, but alpha 1 has, seems to have a little bit of an effect as well. All right, and so red here means that if it has that alpha one and theta value, then essentially all of the passages at that point simplify the knot type, and the blue means that uh, that none of them do essentially. All right, so then we want to go to links and see if the same thing works for links. All right, for knots it looks like it works pretty well. All right, that there is some geometric information there uh, that that would you know, point you to the simplifying spots. For links, um, so just in general, we have the same sort of situation where the linking part of it seems to be isolated, right? They, the supercoiling seems to push it into regions. What we see more often uh, is that 
they tend to leave in kind of the same direction, not in opposite directions like this. They tend to like each other, all right, which I think is sweet, all right. Um, and the other thing that we see again is that there are lots of places where the thing, you know, where the two edges are close enough together that it could act. All right. So if we do this for links, uh, again, now we're looking at the bending angle of that G segment, and we again see that there is an effect uh, of alpha one that more tight bending uh, does improve your likelihood of simplifying the knot, acting at those juxtapositions but it's much milder than what we see for knots, all right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, they're all this link. You know, I forget what it is. Maybe there's six crossings in it or something like that. I can't remember. Maybe it's five. I don't know. I don't want to count in public. It's a little embarrassing. I have trouble above four. So anyway, um, if we go to theta, right, this is the angle at which one goes over the other one. Um, you can see that, again, there's a, more of an effect than what we see for the bending angle. Um, but, it's, but it still doesn't explain everything, right? I mean, here you see kind of much more, many more situations where you could be in that kind of sweet spot for theta, but still not be able to simplify the knot, or simplify the link, I guess it is. Um, but the point is that actually, you know, what we saw before was this region was very good for links and it's very good for knots as well. And so that seems to be kind of a sweet spot here for both of them, which is encouraging. And here's our heat map for links. Again, um, you know, alpha being further this way makes you more likely. So in other words, having more bending makes it more likely that you're gonna, that this juxtaposition will simplify the linking. Um, but clearly, having a, this certain negative theta values um, in general makes you more likely, or that's the, has a bigger effect, I guess, than the bending angle, right? So it's a similar sort of thing to knots. Um, and here they are together with knots and links uh, with the alpha ones. So again, you can see the effect for the knots with the bending is bigger than for the links. Um, and for theta, again, you can see that for knots, it's a bigger effect than for links. Uh, but again, there's this region kind of, say, from minus 60 to minus 20, where in both situations, a great majority of those juxtapositions do simplify the sort of knotting or the entanglement that you have here. All right. Now, so Stone had a paper in PNAS in 2003 that suggested that the theta angle for topo 2 is between minus 60 and minus 30, right? Which is cool because it's right in the range that we were looking at. Um, and then uh, Newman had one where he thought it was uh, that theta should be minus 5. Now, I mean, Andre's the biologist. I'm, I'm a simple man, all right? And... Andre says that, that, that maybe this minus five isn't right, that the experimental setup made it so that it, that's not quite what we have. Um, I guess from my perspective, like, you know, even if it's like this, grabbing it at the, at the like, it's going to make some mistakes, right? It's not going to be perfect. There are going to be some times that it acts and it's at the wrong spot, but it, it just, at some point, it can't happen too often, right? And I don't know if, you know, working 85% of the time is enough, or if you need 95% of the time, or only 50% of the time would work, and I'm not sure that anyone really knows anything about this, and so, <laughs> so it could be that minus five is the right angle, and, you know, only working, you know, 60% of the time is enough, but we would argue that that we think that probably the theta angles between minus 60 and minus 20 would be our guess. All right? And again, from our perspective here, I hate to claim that we're actually doing any biology here, right? The point is that I think what we found is that if you had a machine that were to act at these certain spots with these certain angle preferences, that it would simplify the thing preferably. And conceivably, nature would figure this out somehow, and that's maybe why it would be that way, right? So that's our proposal. All right. 
Um, and here's the combined effect of the heat maps. Again, you can see it seems to work with knots better than links, but so it goes. So then the question is, okay, we have these sweet spots here, right, kind of in this region or down here where um, we're very likely, if we have these theta and alpha angles, to simplify the knot or the, or the link. So where do these things actually happen, right? So then we went back and we took these spots where it did this and we went back to the supercoiled chain to try to figure out where they were. And what we found was that it tended to happen, so this is an example of one of the links, where the two linked parts are together and just when they separate, all right? So just when they come apart, there's this spot right here where you get this kind of negative angle and that seems to be the spot where acting would simplify the thing. So it, it appears to not be working out here. Ideally, it would work at that spot. And since there's kind of only one, you know, that's why we don't see a lot of them. Um, so kind of and kind of not, right? Uh, I mean, the, I, they're not colored in the cell, as far as I understand. <laughs> Is that right, Lynn? Yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, first thing it has to do is get the its glasses on to get the color right. Um, but it's the, our idea here is that it's attaching to the red one, right, and looking for blue spots, I guess. So it, so it would... Um, so it, it's just... So it's colored in the sense in that... The, Okay, that didn't make any sense. What's that? Right. Uh, well, okay, so, but... Uh, yeah, the angles that do that. It, but the point is that we're... Yes. Right, but the, I think the point here is that, the, that our model is that it's grabbing onto the red one and then it has a groove, right? It has a groove that, that has basically, if you happen to be at this other angle, then it can fit in there and it can do the action, right? And so, it, it wouldn't, if it attached to the blue one, the red one wouldn't be aligned with it in that way, and so it wouldn't do the action in the other direction, I think is the point. It could, but... Right. Yes. Right. Uh, yeah, well, uh, but the point is on the links, uh, we never saw, I guess the point is that this, this coupling of angles, we never saw that happen on a common link. Or on, when we were doing linking, we never saw a red, red one or a blue, blue one. Oh, we sampled enough. <laughs> no, it's, uh, I mean, uh, yes, but I guess the, the point is that, you know, we are just, we're taking a snapshot and just looking at what happened at this time, right? So we have a number of snapshots, and we have a number of places on each of those snapshots where it could happen, but we certainly, we're not doing any dynamics where who's on saying, well, it could go there and maybe it could swing around and do something. Well. We're not dealing with that, right? We're saying, okay, well, it would have to be in the snapshot exactly like this, right? So it's a little different. Right. Well, no, but, but we search for all, we look at all of these juxtapositions and see, so this one, for example, we analyzed, but it was in one of those situations where the theta angle 
wasn't in the sweet range, right, and the not type stayed the same or the link type stayed the same, right? Um, all right. Are we good? All right. Okay. So that is the end of my, um, of that part. Um, so in particular, uh, the point is that I guess the supercoiling localizes is not in, in linking. If the topo could somehow kind of recognize maybe these certain theta values, that that could be enough to simplify the knotting, enough to kind of uh, explain how it can be so efficient at unknotting and unlinking things. Um, and also stronger bending will help a little bit as well. All right, so that's my biology stuff. Now I'm getting into my physics stuff that I don't know about, all right? And so I'm going to talk about glue balls. All right, so, um, so this thing is wildly out of scale. The, the quarks and anti-quarks are this size so that I could write quark and anti-quark on them. All right, that's the scale of them. Um, anyway, there are these things called uh, mesons, mesons. Mesons, okay. Mesons are quark-anti-quark pairs. They're held together by the strong force, and I guess um, this uh, strong force can be thought of as an as a exchange of gluons through like a tube. All right, this is, um, all right, so that's our model. And the idea is that these things are cruising around in space. This quark-anti-quark -quark can come together, and in doing so, they kind of destructs and creates, uh, can create a sort of circle thing like this. And it makes the sound boom, all right? It's not in the literature, but I'm pretty sure that it's true, okay? Um, and so, so this is called a glue ball that's just purely a tube of these gluons being cut and exchanged around. And these glue balls exist uh, for like 10 to the minus 21 seconds. They don't have a long life by our, but by their skill, they live very rich lives. All right? Okay. Um, and so Kephart, uh, who's an actual physicist, right, says that, um, that these things, for energy considerations, if they create this... Uh, when they actually come together and create this tube, then the tube shrinks, all right, and you get into what's called a tight knot state, all right? So this is it without a thick tube around it. That's it with like a maximally thick tube around it. And this is an image I got from some paper that was out, I think, last year of what a glue ball might look like. But the point is that it's a long tube, all right? And so if you have a long tube and the two ends come together, then there's a chance that it's knotted, all right? Okay, so the other thing I should say is Jason and I, uh, with others, but um, have been trying to create these tight knots for many, many years, right? For well, what's really a frightening number of years at this point, like 20 or something. And so we have computer programs and stuff to simulate what these things look like when they're tight. All right, and so what I want to talk about here is the decay of these glue balls. So you have a glue ball that we assume is in some tightened state, and we want to know what would it decay to, right? Over time, over its course of its short life, it's going to decay maybe down to just a linear thing and then fall apart. So um, the two ways that it can decay is via, or at least two of the ways that it can decay, is quantum tunneling, which is a word that at least Renzo used yesterday. I was heartened by that, all right? So there's quantum tunneling, and the idea is that you just, you kind of pass one edge through another edge, which is exactly the sort of thing that we were doing with TOPO2, right? One piece of software, two different areas. That's the beauty of it, right? Um, and the other thing that you can do is reconnection, all right? So you could reconnect these things as well using this uh, orientation, um, preserving, I guess is a, orientation preserving reconnection. Um, so this gets into this uh, reconnection stuff that DeWitt's been talking about for a while, and Marielle talked about as well yesterday, and Renzo as well. Um, right, so this quantum tunneling is like TOPO4, and so that's what I basically just want to show you some pretty pictures. All right, so here's a tight trefoil knot, and now every time, so our model is that every time the tube runs into itself, that's what these yellow things are, all right? There's, whenever the tube touches itself, 
there's one of these one of these tubes goes from the middle of one piece to the middle of the other piece. All right. So those are like tube contacts, and now I want to color them by doing a quantum tunneling event at that spot, right? So I'm going to take it like this, then I'm going to pass it through itself and see what type of knot that we get, see how it would decay in that situation. And so if you start with a trefoil, what you see is that all of them turn into unknots. So if you pass any of these edges through any of the other edges, it goes to an unknot. But the question is, what do we see for other knots? So um, here's the figure eight knot. All right, so again, the figure eight knot only has one knot that it decays to, and that's to the unknot. All right, but if we get up to the five one knot, for example, um, it decays mostly to a trefoil, basically all these ones on the outside, but a couple of spots it decays to the five two knot. So if you pass that edge through that edge, and of course, this thing would be thickened, right? I just made it thin so it would be easier to see. Um, it can pass to the 5-2 knot. Um, and the 5-2 knot can turn into the unknot if you hit one part of it, to the trefoil if you hit another part of it, and then there's something that's actually kind of back here where it can also turn into a 5-1, right? So there seem to be some, like, in most of the spots, the thing simplifies the knotting, and in some spots, it, it will kind of make the knotting either kind of equivalent or more complicated, but they tend to be isolated spots, right? And Jason will, uh, someday I'll talk to you about this as well, because we've got this compression thing that we can put into this model as well. But it, the also, well, so one thing is just, like I created these pictures and then I just sat in my office and I looked at them because I found them very beautiful, all right? Um, but the other thing is see how it kind of, um, it kind of divides the knot into a couple pieces, right? Kind of there's this one twisted version over here, and then there's another version, of, or there's a diff, kind of a different area over here, which I think is kind of interesting um, and might tell us something about the knots in general as well. Um, to get to some more complicated ones, so here's the seven one knot, which is, uh, which I guess that's a twist knot, right? And so that has areas where you can pass, if you act at that clasp, all right? Then it goes directly to the unknot. If you start acting in other regions where the twisting happens, then you can simplify to other knots. Um, the, the tight knot, uh, the ideal knot, depending upon, oh, this is a 6-2. I meant right here. Um, oh, so that doesn't go all the way to the unknot. It goes to the 5-1. Okay, so uh, the point is that these ideal knots or tight knots don't always get into a super symmetric position. All right, so. Uh, What's that? Very symmetric, right? <laughs> Excellent point, right? I can say that in a math crowd, and they won't. Uh, it, it's not as problem problematic, um, right? So anyway, these these are a function of the you know of the configurations, right? If you change the configuration, you'd see different places where it would act. But these are the Titan ones. Um, so for most of the seven one they pass down to the five one. So it basically just gets rid of one of the twists, I guess. Oh, the six two is, six two must be what's, right. Okay, so here's the six, six two, which passes to several different types of knots. Again, here's one that's more complicated or two that's more complicated, but they're just kind of these isolated spots. Um, eight seventeen. I, now I just started grabbing ones that I thought looked cool. Uh, 818 was probably my favorite, right? It has kind of one side of it that all passes to a positive trefoil, and then it has another side of it that passes all to the minus trefoil. Um, and here again, you have, for the 817, you have a couple of spots uh, where the, it passes to more complicated ones, but again, those are kind of isolated in the middle. Uh, if we go up to 10 crossings, 935, I don't remember, is there anything special about 935? I guess I kind of remember it before. What's, what's special about it, Ken? Okay, it's a pain in the neck. So 935 has a bad attitude, super bad attitude, or, but that's okay, right? Okay, so, okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so 935, like, almost has everything switching to the 7 knot, which I didn't see very many times going up to 10 crossings. This is, I think, 
uh, one of the only ones, with just a few isolated spots that got more complicated. Um, you know, here's a 10-8 knot, which again isolates into kind of these three regions. Um, 1032, which isolated into a number of different regions, which are kind of all their own thing, which I thought was cool. Um, I don't know what I liked about this one. It's 1041. Why not? All right. Um, and then some other ones. Uh, this was a situation, there are a couple ones right here where you end up in a straight, so one of the things that these tight knots can have is these straight regions. And in the straight regions, you can have just kind of um, spots. That, do I have one more? Okay, I do have it. I'll, we'll see that better on the next one. So 10-123 is kind of a, um, related to the 818 knot, and it has the same sort of behavior, right? Kind of half of it goes to one thing, half of it goes to another. Um, and what else here? Okay, and here we see some of these kind of strange regions. Here's a straight region right there. In straight regions, you don't have to have these tube contacts, which is like what you see there and right there. And a little bit right here, you have ones that are not, that are kind of just barely, you know, in, in most of these tight knots, they're trying to tighten down, right? And so it's, you get these like clasp situations where they're kind of tightening down on each other. Um, but occasionally you have things that are kind of riding side by side, right? And in those situations, you don't have as much of, you know, you don't have as many of those struts. You have just kind of enough um, to keep them from falling down on each other. So anyway, um, I don't really have anything to, uh, to conclude about these glue balls, except that I think this is really cool. And I'm going to do the reconnection events. And then I'm going to talk to anyone who said reconnection that I remember in the last five years and show you what the pictures look like. And we'll go from there. All right? Um, so that's where we are. Uh, so I would just like to end by uh, thanking our organizers and ICTP uh, for having us. Uh, it's always fun to come here. And I have a number of collaborators from different parts of these things um, uh, who are right here. And thank you very much. <laughs>